Morning again, everybody. It's me again, Mr. Lockridge, and we're getting ready to head into chapel. And we have some students that are actually at school today. It is amazing. Hello, you wonderful and amazing students. Okay, so what we're going to be talking about today is about wisdom. Okay, what makes a person truly wise? Not just smart, not just knowing academics, but what makes a person truly wise? So we're going to be going back to the book of James. And don't forget, the people in the book of James were being dispersed all over. These were the very first Christians. James is trying to give them some advice about, you know, how they should act as Christian. What sets us apart from all the other people? So, first of all, we are going to be led by Mrs. Sims and Ann and Len in worship this morning, and then after that, I'll be seeing you right over there in the chapel, and it is wonderful to have you back on campus today. So pray with me, please. Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for our prayers being answered by having the students come back to school. I pray that we may just, Father, remember how powerful your love is, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. See you inside in just a couple of minutes. Aloha.
good morning again, everybody, and welcome back to chapel. Today, we're going to be talking about true wisdom. Now, I have met a lot of people in my many years of ministry, and we have had a lot of pastors and youth leaders and missionaries all come to HBA to lead chapels or just to talk to the students about a number of different things. But let me tell you a story of two different pastors. The first pastor uh, was brought to HBA by one of our local pastors, and he came here to see the school. And this, his guest's name was Peter. Now, he was African, and he was only about five foot tall, but he was a very strong person. And, you know, he introduced me to him. He says, this is Peter. I'm like, hey, Peter, I'm Rob. Uh, tell me about yourself. And the first thing that Peter said to me was, I am Zulu. And that was amazing. For all of y'all that do not know, the Zulu are a tribe in southern Africa that lived in pre-colonial times. And they did not like the white settlers, the Dutch and the German, coming into their land to colonize it. So there were wars between the Zulu tribe and the European tribes. And the Zulu were considered ferocious. Okay? And they killed many, many people down there. And there were some missionaries that heard about the Zulu tribe. And so they sent missionaries into the tribe to tell them about Jesus. Well, not only did they not get to tell them about Jesus, they ate them. Okay? They were also cannibals. But people of faith continue to go into areas because telling people about Jesus is one of the most important things that we can do. Our school was founded by missionaries. And... By the early 1800s, the Zulu tribe had completely changed from fierce and warlike to now a tribe that worshiped God in just incredible and beautiful, beautiful ways. As a matter of fact, it is the Zulu tribe that sent out missionaries of Zulus to the other tribes in sub-Saharan Africa to tell even other people about who Jesus is and how they can be save that they can be reborn and know God's forgiveness. Now, Peter was not just Zulu, but he ran a Christian school for orphans in Africa. And he had hundreds of orphans in this school. And it was kind of amazing uh, because the school was in absolute despair. The school, the children of the school itself, had to grow a great amount of their own food. And the year that Peter came here, he was telling me about there hadn't been any rain, so the children could not grow their own food, so they were completely dependent upon God for pro providing for their needs. And I'm thinking, uh, how is that working out? And he told me that every day that someone would bring large bags of beans and corn to the orphanage, and that is what sustained the students through these times of really tough thing. And I'm thinking, beans and corn? I asked him, Peter, is that animal feed? He says, yes. And we're very thankful to God for providing our daily bread. Peter is probably the most humble man of faith I have ever met. And he told me about miracles that God is doing in his school. And it absolutely fascinated me. Now, on the flip side, we had this young youth pastor. His name was Brian. Uh, he used to be on the island. He's not on the island anymore. He came to our Christian Emphasis Week with another pastor on the island. He was his mentor. And Brian was a young guy. He was about 22 years old. He had this really big, bushy beard that was really quite impressive. But he had a certain arrogance about him. And when I asked him, so, Bri, what do you do? He's like, I study the culture. I'm like, okay, what does that mean? And he said, today's culture is totally different than the culture you grow up in. Today, kids have instant gratification. And he's trying to talk all like he's a philosopher or something like that. And I'm just kind of sitting there listening to him, and he's saying, you know, the people are different, the children are different, the way they communicate is different, even the drugs are different today than they were, you know, even 10 years ago. And I was like, yo, Brian, you know, um, 
have you ever read the book of Ecclesiastes? Because, you know, Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes tells us that there's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. And, you know, I tried to help him out a little bit there and tell him about people have always wanted instant gratification. There's always been instant communication. We would actually talk to each other face to face. We would actually pick up a telephone and actually call somebody and talk to them. That is instant communication. You know, there's always going to be gossip. You know, we would go to the mall or we would go to the arcade. We would hang out with our friends, you know. And as for the drug things, even people in ancient Egypt, you know, had their beer, their wine, and other things that were bad for them. Things are still the same as they are today as they were way back when. Mommies still love their children. Parents want the best for their children. Teenagers are going to get rebellious. And some people will cheat, steal, or do other really bad things. And Brian, you know, he, he listened to me. I don't know if he heard me. And I was outside, you know, just talking to the kids, and people would come talk to him because he had that huge beard, and, I mean, it was noticeable. And they were like, hey, who are you? And he'd be like, I am Pastor Brian. I study the culture. And the kids would just kind of look at him and, okay, that's fine, see you, and walk away. When it came time for lunch, you know, it's like, Brian, uh, you want a beef or you want a chicken bento? And he looked at me and says, that's Pastor Brian. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Uh, yo, bearded boy, what do you want, chicken or beef? You know, and, you know, his wisdom was not the wisdom that I saw in Pastor Peter from South Africa. You know, Peter, the Zulu, had this great faith and wisdom that came from God. Brian just wanted people to think he was important. And actually, what he was was just obnoxious. And these are two entirely different things. Now, let me read you this passage from the book of James, chapter 3, verse 13 through 18. James, chapter 3, verse 13 through 18. So what James is going to tell us here is, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in humility that come from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy, and selfish ambition in your hearts. Do, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes down from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. So James starts by saying, who is wise and understanding among you? Well, obviously, most of us want to think of ourselves as wise. Nobody wants to think that they're stupid, okay? The real challenge is demonstrating that wisdom. Are you tr truly wise or do you just know a lot of obscure facts and trivial things? And then James gives us a self-evaluation. Do you live a good life that is shown by deeds done in humility or that come from wisdom? Or are you harboring bitterness, envy, selfishness, and ambition? James further defines different types of wisdom. He says, such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. You know, there are many different things that we can learn from in life. Some of these are of great benefit, and some of these things, sadly, lead to destruction. A number of years ago I had this freshman girl that would come into my office and she wanted to know about drugs, illegal drugs. And you know, my door is always open. Any one of you can come into my office anytime that you want, talk about anything 
that you want. And so, you know, I'm not going to tell her stop talking about that or anything like that. I want her to be free to talk to me. But, you know, she would ask her things, you know, what does weed actually feel like? And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? You know, I can look it up online for you if you want. And, you know, she's like, have you ever heard of ecstasy? And, you know, these conversations got kind of unusual. And, you know, we would be discussing this and I'd have to start asking her, why are we talking about these things? Well, she just says, oh, I'm just curious. I, I wouldn't do anything like that. Well, it wasn't much longer after that that she got a little bit too curious and her personality began to change and she started hanging out with other people and not even people her age. She's hanging out with college students from UH and from KCC and she was, she was telling me about going to parties with them and you know, I'm telling her, it's like, excuse me, you're like, what, 14, 15 years old? You know, um, I... I'm not your parent, but I got to tell you, that's not right. And she would just laugh it off. Say, I, I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. And pretty soon, she felt like she was better than, you know, all of her friends here at HBA. And when she went from laughing with her friends to just being on her phone the whole time, and she now became too cool for HBA. She was living outside the bubble in what she called the real world. And then soon after, she started to be mean to her classmates. She was getting in trouble with her teachers. And when the vice principal called her in to his office, from what he told me, you know, she says that, you know, if you keep trying to discipline me and all that, I've got some friends that can come down here and blow up this stupid school. Well, you don't say things like that because when you say things like that, we call the police immediately because that is taken as a threat. And there were four police cars down in front of the gym with the police officers talking to this young lady, asking her about her friends and all of that. And not long after that incident, she was, let's just call it, invited to leave HBA and never come back. You know, she thought that she was really smart in the ways of the world. But this so-called wisdom that she had, it certainly didn't come down from heaven. This wisdom was filled with self-ambition and disorder, and it led to evil practices. You know, contrast that with what James tells us. He says, but the wisdom that comes down from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit impartial and sincere. You know, we had a boy, I think it was the class of 06, that his one dream in life was to be a medical missionary. And this is a person that would go to developing countries, third world countries, and just be able to help the people there, be able to diagnose illnesses that they have, uh, be able to help them with broken limbs or if they have a cleft palate or something like that. And <clears throat> And this was his one desire, and he achieved it. You know, and it was far more than just getting good grades and getting into a good college and then getting a medical degree. For him, it was about the people. And every time that we had a ministry that went out to Nanakuli or Waianae, every time that we did a homeless ministry, that we did a peanut butter and jelly ministry out to the people that were living on the beach, he was right there, and he was always taking the lead. Because for him, it was all about the people, you know? He took a great interest in homeless children. He took a great interest and listened to those who were in pain. He had a true compassion for other people, even if he didn't know them. He wanted to show God's love to each one of them. And that's what James was talking about here. Now, James continues in chapter 4, and he says this in James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desire? That battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. But when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives 
that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Let's just be honest with each other. We live in a world that is full of sin and troubles. And in this sin, in this world, people are going to fight. Okay? <clears throat> I was talking to a student that goes to Highlands Intermediate, which is right across the street from my church. And, you know, she's just kind of talked to me about day-to-day -day life at Highlands Intermediate. And she talked about this one fight between a couple of boys. And I asked her, you know, are there a lot of fights? And she says, there's a fight like almost every day. And it's like, is it just boys or do the girls fight too? And she says, oh, the girls' fights are far worse than the boys' fights because they're pulling each other's hair. And, I mean, she just told me things that I just had a hard time understanding. But, you know, people fight, okay? People fight in business and politics, education, marriage, sports, and People even fight in churches. In fact, this is the specific arena that James is talking to us about right here. Let me give you an example about how people fight in churches. It's not going to be a physical fight, but when I was in Louisville, there was a church there. It was a very large church, a couple of thousand people, and they were having a church split. In other words, you had two angry groups of people in that church. And I was trying to figure out what's going on here. Well, the whole problem came down to they were getting ready to change the flowers in the front of the church. Now, here in Hawaii, you usually have fresh, fresh flowers up on the altar in the sanctuary every single week because we've got flowers everywhere, here, here, everywhere. But on the mainland, a lot of times you're going to buy plastic flowers, and they're going to be up there for maybe a year, sometimes a decade. Okay, and the fight in this church was should the, should the flowers be purple flowers or orange flowers? And I'm thinking, how could such an itty bitty issue split such a big church? And these people were just backbiting each other, talking stink about each other. And I talked to the pastor about this, and it's like, you know, why don't they just compromise and mix purple and orange flowers and just put them up there? And he said to me some words I'll never forget. He says, you don't understand. It's not what color the flowers will be. It's who gets to say what color the flowers will be. And it was all about this pride and this envy and this I'm better than you and I have control over all these things. You know, people are going to act like people. And people are sinful. I am, you are, everybody is. And James tells us that these fights come from the desires that battle within us. You see, we covet. And a lot of people don't understand what that word covet means. Some people say it means we desire something or we want what another person has. Some would say that coveting is like jealousy or envy. And all of these explanations are close, but it's more than that. Coveting means I should have what you have, and I hate you for having it. It's a very aggressive thing. You know, I've seen this many times here at HBA when a boy or a girl makes the varsity team and somebody that thinks they're just as good does not make it. Not only do they hate the basketball team now, but they hate that person. They think should not have made that team because they should have made the team. And excuse me, you've probably seen things like this also. You know, or it's like when a person gets an A on an exa exam without really studying hard, and a classmate who spent hours studying gets a B or a C, and now they hate that person because they got an A. That is what coveting has. Not just, I'm envious of what you have, but I hate you, that you have it and I don't. And a lot of people just get eaten up with this kind of coveting. And James even says that some will kill to get what they want. You know, of course, few people actually commit murder in a literal sense, but we're all guilty of murder in our hearts and with our lips. Matthew tells us in Matthew 5, 21, You have heard that it was said to people long ago, Do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother 
will be subject to judgment. Or in 1 John chapter 3, verse 15, John says, anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life. You know, there is a lot of hate in our world today. You know, turn on the national news. You see people burning down their own neighborhoods or accosting people for just going out and eating dinner. And there are people that are find, trying to find new ways to hate other people in our day and age today. And hate is never the answer. Okay, let me just say that again. Hate is never the answer because hate just leads to more hate. And hate is never satisfied. Hate is a type of monster that lives within us that the more we feed it, the more it desires. And this kind of hatred, this kind of anger, we have to identify it within ourselves to deal with it. James tells us, you do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. And, you know, a lot of people pray very selfishly. Like when I was your age, I would pray to win the Publishers Clearinghouse Sweepstakes. It was like a lottery. And, you know, it would pay you $5,000 a month for the rest of your life. And, you know, I would pray, God, just let me win this sweepstakes. If, if you let me win it, you know, I'm, I'm not even going to give you 10% of it. I would give you 20% of it. You know, I never won, obviously. And then I've seen, or I've had high school girls come into my office saying, can we pray here, Mr. Lockridge? I say, sure, what are you praying about? And, you know, it's like, we're going to ask God that Kainoa kind of will ask Kylie to prom. It's like, um, okay, that's not really how this works. But, you know, people pray with their own selfish motives. And, you know what, sometimes people even get angry at God when he doesn't answer their prayers. No matter how selfish or pleasure-motivated pleasure motivated these prayers are. You know, God's promise to answer our prayers and giving us what we ask for must be governed by all the Bible's teaching about prayer. This is not about name it and claim it. The Apostle John helps balance it out for us. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, he says, This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask for anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. The key here is according to his will. True Christians pray for things that please God, not for things that fuel their own envious, selfish desires. And so this is what true wisdom is really about, being humble, okay? Not seeking our own will, not trying to look grand in other people's eyes, but helping other people see who God is. Now, I have a few reflection questions for you today. First one is, who is the greatest person you have ever met? Who is the greatest person you have ever met? For me, one of the greatest people I ever met was Peter from Africa. Now, to you, it could be somebody that's a teacher or somebody in your family. It could be a coach or it could be somebody else. But who is the greatest person you ever met? And why is that person the greatest that you've ever met? Question two. Have you ever tried to make yourself seem more important than you really are? Did you ever try to make yourself seem more important than you really are? Why was that? And how did that work out for you? Question number three. Have you ever felt that you were really smart about something only to find out that what you were really smart about didn't matter? It just didn't matter. What was that that you felt really smart about? Number four, 
have you ever prayed to God out of selfishness, like I did to win a lot of money? Have you ever prayed to God for something purely out of selfishness? And what was that? And finally, number five, how can you pray according to God's will? How can you pray according to God's will? I want you to think about those things. And to close us out today, I'm just going to close us in prayer. So if you would bow your heads with me, please. Father, just thank you so much for these students. Thank you, Lord, for allowing them to come back to school. And I pray, Lord, that they may each pray according to your will, that they would not be conceited with all these false pleasures that sometimes we find and not trying to look big in other people's eyes, but being humble in your eyes, Lord. Father, please keep them well. Help them to learn, Lord. Help them just to enjoy being back with their friends. And I pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, guys, and I will be seeing you around, seeing you around the school. It's great to have you back. Talk to you later. Aloha.